Ah, <sighs> Wittgenstein. Yeah, that got dark fast. So Wittgenstein. <laughs> Last time we covered a lot of the overall themes. So maybe this time I had suggested that we just pick out passages that we know we especially wanted to talk about and then read them and then talk about them. And then that way we'll maybe get through more than five pages. Does that sound reasonable? Uh, I think so, yeah. Sure. Well, the first one I had on my little list was number 22. 22, I think, might be the only spot where he name drops Gottlob Frege, who we had an episode on a while ago. And it says, Frege's idea that every assertion contains an assumption, which is the thing that is asserted, really rests on the possibility found in our language of writing every statement in the form, it is asserted that such and such is the case. But that such and such is the case is not a sentence in our language. So far, it is not a move in the language game. And if I write not, it is asserted that, but it is asserted, colon, such and such is the case, the words it is asserted simply become superfluous. We might write every statement in the form of a question followed by a yes. Is it raining? Yes. Would this show that every statement contained a question? Etc. So this is referring not only to Frege, but also to Wittgenstein's earlier idea that language is fundamentally about making assertions. And that if you have something else, well, maybe you could come up with like an assertion. You know, if you say, I doubt that you speak English, you have to analyze that in terms of what would the primary. OK, there's a there's a proposition in there. You speaking English. But he says, well, that's actually here. He says that is not itself an assertion. As soon as you look at anything the least bit difficult, he thinks that this idea that everything can be reduced to assertion falls apart. Just for background, Frege, as part of his logical calculus that he developed, right, which led to our mathematical logic, he had a sign, a symbol for assertion. I don't remember what it looked like exactly. I think it preceded the sentence, right? To say, this is being asserted. Right. And so you could have different modalities of the same proposition. Yeah. Is it being asserted? Is it being questioned? Is it being doubted? Whatever. Frege and those folks want to say that, that the assertion is the basic one. But Wittgenstein says, well, you know, why would you necessarily assume that? And 23 he says, you know, but how many kinds of sentences are there? Say assertion, question, command. There are countless kinds, countless different kinds of use of what we call symbols, words, sentences. And this multiplicity is not something fixed given once and for all, but new types of language, new language games, as we may say, come into existence and others become obsolete and get forgotten. This is kind of the, oh, yeah. I found the coolest part of the book, just that this giant list that he gives of different you know, if you think asserting is the basic one, he says, review the multiplicity of language games in the following examples and in others. Giving orders and obeying them, describing the appearance of an object or giving its measurement, constructing an object from a description, a drawing, reporting an event, speculating about an event, forming and testing a hypothesis, presenting the results of an experiment in tables and diagrams, making up a story and reading it, play acting, singing catches, guessing riddles, making a joke, telling it, solving a problem in practical arithmetic, translating from one language to another, asking, thanking, cursing, greeting, praying, etc., and it ends, it is interesting to compare the multiplicity of the tools in language and of the ways in which they are used, the multiplicities of kinds of words and sentence with what logicians have said about the structure of language, including the author of the Tractatus <laughs> Logical <laughs> Philosophicus. That guy was a dick. Namely, <laughs> moi. <laughs> so that was thought provoking to me that, yeah, okay, unless you were of the mind, like you were expressing last time, Dylan, that like, well, why would you think assertion is basic? Why would you think you can reduce everything to you know, logical symbology because it was that simple? I think it's worth articulating why you might not think it at least, or what is the contrast that he's unearthing here? The note that I had about this section was that he was saying that assertions involve expectations. So our assertions are not expectations, but language involves expectations. That's one of the ways I understood him to be claiming that what language is doing in a sentence is not an assertion. Saying that it's an assertion is not enough. Mm -hmm. That's the short version of his criticism is that you do have assertions, but assertions don't characterize language completely and sufficiently. And this goes right to his notion that he wants to keep calling it a game in that the rules are different and in fact innumerable for the different kinds of games. And this is what I meant why I was thinking about it in terms of expectations, because a lot of a game involves what you expect to be happening either next or the implication of what has happened now for what you should expect in the future. That is, you're following rules. So, you know, your expectations imply rules and rules allow you to structure expectations. So I guess that's why, to me, the distinction he was making was that language is about expectations and not about assertions. 
that might be part of his point. I don't know if that's his point here, though. I think that, like, that's all right. And he's certainly saying that assertion is not at the bottom of how language works. Nor can you say that here are the four things at the bottom of every of language. Assertion, doubt, question, command. And that's everything. I mean, Frege's work in the philosophy of language is really sort of ancillary to his logical work. He's trying to find ways to connect his logic work to language so that he can do his project more easily. And Wittgenstein is saying, like, you can't cross that gap. You can't just come up with a sign and say, like, oh, here's an assertion. Beautiful. And then that's all that indicates. And there you are. Like, there's no reason to think that at the bottom of even that particular kind of sentence is one form of assertion. Say more about that. I mean, or explain it more, right? It's, I mean, right now, what you're saying is a kind of ostention. You're invoking Wittgenstein pointing. And maybe that's all he's doing in section 23 is he's just pointing at, look at all these examples of language games that aren't characterizable by assertions. And if he fully spelled it out, he would give the same exact sentence and say that I could have them manifest each one of those ways of having a language game with exactly the same sentence. And maybe that's all that he's going to do is, as an act of ostension, point to the fact that language acts as a language game. It seems to be unpackable more than that, that you can point to the failure of assertion as being the end all of language without just pointing at it. Right. He's not just pointing and saying, look at all these other things. He's making the point, and these other things also will fail to characterize a language. I'm not saying, like, no, Frege had it wrong having four things. Really, there are 20 things. You can't just say, these are the number of things there are, because new things are constantly emerging. So, I just don't think he's talking about rules here, rules and expectation. He's just saying, new things are constantly emerging. What is it about language that's doing that? Probably that there are multiple players doing this thing. Well, there are multiple human activities and intentions and human beings want to accomplish, right? Well, but multiple isn't the same thing as innumerable, right? He's saying that he's not numerable, right? right? So for this to really work for him, and I'm on board with it, but I'm just trying to see where it is that you're going to say it's innumerable. What's the argument for that? It has to be that, I mean, even you can see from some of these examples, I don't know if we're actually going to find an argument in here because that's not the way he works. But from some of these examples that, you know, a number of them seem to be different kinds of assertions, right? It's not like assertions and questions and commands are fundamentally different. I guess what I'm trying to get at is trying to figure out what it is to do an examination of language. Like we think that traditionally, maybe you have the syntax, so you can talk about what is grammatical and did you use the plural verb with the plural noun and did you have a noun in the sentence? at all, that kind of stuff, just will a sentence make sense? And then you have the semantics, which to me has always meant, what do the words mean? And the easiest way to think about that is just, you know, what do they refer to just in this sort of ostensive way? And you understand, well, okay, maybe the word and isn't ostensive. You just figure that out by context when you have enough other things, enough nouns that are ostensive, enough verbs that you can, you know, see someone running and say run, etc. And so you build up something and then that's it for a theory of language. You've got the syntax, you've got the semantics. And a part of that complete semantics then would be to, if you're getting to the sentence level, to distinguish between commands and questions and statements, but it wouldn't really go beyond that socially, right? You'd say, I'm done with my theory of language now. But I think what Wittgenstein is saying is that you just can't make this distinction between semantics and the social uses of words. Right. As long as there could be other things people could be doing socially, and we could make up a game right now that every time I say the forbidden word that is uh, philosophy bro's real name, everybody's going to go ah at me. Uh, so there, we just made up a new language game. So now the forbidden word sort of doesn't just refer to him anymore. Right. It refers, to, it is meant to elicit this response and have me correct myself and say, oh, I'll edit that out, whatever. So it's the lack of a lookup table. When we say multiplicity, we're meaning multiplicity of meaning. There isn't a one-to-one -one correspondence. A joke is a perfect example here. The fact that you can have irony, things like that. Right. So I think what drives the multiplicity and in the, the innumerability is the innumerability of ways there are to live, right? Where he thinks like language mm -hmm. games are forms of life, the reason we can't just strictly enumerate the number of ways to use languages because we can't strictly enumerate the ways people can be or do and languages as far out as that. So he's saying something like, for Frege's project to work, it needs to be the case that like, oh, people only do five things. They assert, they doubt, they question, they command, they joke. And that's all. Everything people do can be reduced to those five things. And since we can't reduce it to those five or to 20, we can't reduce language to that either. And there isn't, like, a separate kind of language that does access those five things in general. That's just not how language works. 
And I think the implication here is that this throws a wrench in the idea that you're going to develop this ideal logical calculus that in any way does justice to the way language is really used. I mean, I think when Frege and Wittgenstein developed this calculus, I think they thought that everything important could be reduced to it, right? Even if language has complexity, ultimately, all that complexity can be reduced to these very simple atomic statements, which are essentially descriptive. They're essentially trying to link mm -hmm. language to these facts or states of affairs in the world. The point here is that much of what goes on in language is not descriptive in that way. Well, so I think it's important that the multiplicity has to do with the ways, right? So, for instance, in these cases of different language games that he gives lists of, in the individual terms, we would say, well, I sort of know what those individual terms mean. Mm -hmm. But when I use these different language games, I realize that, in fact, they mean different things than even what I might have thought they meant. And that's where this multiplicity is coming in. It's both the multiplicity of the ways I can use the um, language in terms of the rules, the individual games, like praying or reporting reporting an event or constructing, but also the way that folds in on the meaning of the individual words. So it's not even as if individual words are atomic, and then you have, following the calculus notion, that each of these games amount to just different sorts of rules or functions. Mm -hmm. He has to have it be the case that the atoms themselves are multiple in their meanings. There are no atoms. There are no atoms, yes. Because if there were atoms and you just had a multiplicity of functions, you would still have something just more complicated than Frege's description, right? right? It has to be that the meaning of the words gets affected by the games themselves. It would be like having the X and Y values in a function get affected by the function itself. Right. I think what makes this hard to understand then, the way you're describing it, which is apt, that is, maybe we don't mean by these words what we think we mean. Well, that seems ridiculous because isn't meaning something we're aware of? Some, I know what I mean. And so he spends half the book arguing against that notion of meaning. Yeah, very counterintuitive. Yeah, that seems right. So just to clarify, when I say there are no atoms, I don't mean like it's impossible for a word to be atomic. He thinks there are very clear contexts in which words serve in that sort of atomic role, where like that dog lives there, and that's pretty simple. But I can say that same sentence and actually be saying my best friend constantly pisses off his girlfriend. And I'm like, oh yeah, that dog lives there. Same atoms, and I'm, I'm doing air quotes. For the listener at home, I'm doing air quotes. <laughs> same atoms, but completely different meaning. So there are atoms, except when there aren't. And it turns out they're usually not. Yeah, he argues at certain places in this against the old idea that you could just decompose every complex description into atoms, right? To atomic right. sentences. Because for the early Wittgenstein, the idea was that well, there's some dispute, but at least for Russell, it's pretty clear that a statement like the dog is there could be further decomposed until you get to these logically simple atomic statements, which I don't even know what they would be, right? But you would be reducing everything as much as possible into its parts and then making statements about those parts. Right. For Russell, they were phenomenal. You know, there's a red patch in this corner of my field of vision. And for Wittgenstein, we could not figure out what the hell he meant. Yeah, it's almost like, you know, you're creating a computer program and you're building the dog pixel by pixel mm -hmm. and the atomic statements describe the location and color of every pixel, let's say. And then any statement about the dog is a compound statement, descriptive statement, which is logically related and can be broken down into all the atomic sentences. Right. So if you knew all the atomic facts, all the state of all the atomic sentences, then you could d derive every other truth that could be. Right. Yeah, and, th and that turns on the fact that you have to have both the atomic sentences and that there is only one set of ways of relating them or a numerable, explicit, determined set of ways of relating them. Right. They're either true yeah. or false, the atomic ones. And you need to be able to verify things, right? Yeah, but saying that they're either true or false has to do with the relations, because it's more than just the atoms themselves. It also has to do with the way they're related to one another. And this game business has to do with there being a multiplicity of relations, and that reflects back on the putative atoms themselves. I think that the notion of game is more his way of pointing out that in any particular language, Language, a language game is an interaction among persons according to rules that they all sort of agree on. And the fact that we have lots of language games going on at any given time 
is just the indicator that we are at any given time interacting according to lots of different sets of rules that with different people we will agree on in different ways. But the notion of a game is, I think, just his way of isolating. This is just some very small set of rules that you're interacting according to in this interaction that you all agree on. We're making moves, right. and those moves can be right or wrong according to the way the game is played, according to the practice of the community. Right. But you don't have to even be playing the same game, right? I mean, isn't that comes along with this? As what? Someone to whom you're talking? You do for it to make sense to someone. You do have to be able to... No. They at least have to be able to figure out your game. Otherwise, what you're doing is not meaningful to them. It's nonsense to them. So it could be nonsense. That's one possibility, right? A good example would be where I simply don't understand the other person's language, right? I'm just listening to them speak. I don't have the benefit of any other kind of information. And it's just nonsense. But of course, there are plenty of other cases where I understand, or I think I understand what they're saying, but I am operating and understanding it under a different set of rules, a different language game. And so therefore, from the standpoint of the other person, I'm confused, but I understand exactly what they're saying in terms of my language game. And so you end up getting in a discussion about, you know, sorting out exactly what you mean by something. I think the problem here is that we don't issue the, the rules. We don't make the practice. That's a community level authority, right? So it's not like each of us has our own set of rules. That's issued by the community. And it's that practice that we are born into without any choice, really. I mean, it sort of reminds me of uh, the Susser podcast. So you didn't like the example I just gave? I just invented a game of we can't say philosophy bros real names and that counts as... I thought you could have it either way. You can explicitly issue rules and as long as we all agree to play with that, that's fine. But let's say, so you explicitly issue this... Wait, wait, I don't understand this whole business of, of agreeing. It's not like everybody sits down and has a constitution regarding their languages. No, but when we learn language, we are right. learning to participate according to the more or less standard rules. Good God, more or less standard. The customs. We are learning to Jesus participate in a language form. Yeah, in a practice. And how, right, so this is why meaning is used. So like when you were in middle school and you discovered sarcasm, that was like a miraculous thing. When a kid first discovers sarcasm, it's such a big moment in his life. And then he alienates all of his friends by being constantly sarcastic. And maybe I'm getting too autobiographical here. Not important. <laughs> but the point is that like learning to do sarcasm is learning a new language game. And no one, like, sits down and says, okay, here are the rules of sarcasm. What happens is a parent says something like, yeah, you can stay up as late as you want. And you're like, awesome. And they're like, no, I was being sarcastic. And then you get better at sarcasm as you lose friends and start to realize you have to temper yourself. And that's how people get better at particular language games. You can sit down and issue explicit rules like, every time you guys say my name, we make a funny sound. But that's not typically how language learning proceeds. But also, even when you do that, it's still established at the community level. The idea is that we can't each issue our, you know, this sort of gets us at the private language argument. We can't just each individually have our own set of rules and imagine we're interpreting things according to our own idiosyncratic set of rules. The game and meaning occur between at least two people. I like thinking about this whole, what if two people are using different language games? Yeah, it's a good thought experiment, yeah. I was using sarcasm and you didn't realize I was, but what if, you know, it seems like you could have double meanings. So let's say I just come up to you and engage you in conversation and you think we're playing the engaging in light conversation language game. But what I'm really doing is feeling you out to see if you're going to be a good mark for my robbing you later, for my con. So in a sense, it seems like the conning language game is something I'm trying to do with language. I didn't make up what conning is. I didn't make up the fact that there is property and there is robbery, you know, and all this kind of stuff. But I'm still doing something that you're not in on, even though I'm communing with you and you think I'm making sense. That's just deception, though. I mean, the con otter still understands what the meaning ostensibly is, right? They know what the mark mm -hmm. is going to believe that they're saying. And... Ostensibly, normally a great word, maybe... Maybe go with I know. supposedly in this context. Austin, uh, ostentatiously. Ostentatious. Right. No, I said ostensibly because it was just too irresistible in the context of, yeah, ostensive. So anyway, but yeah. Right. So that's really good. You were actually making a pun. I thought you were just playing the normal same thing language <laughs> game. And I was like, whoa, you got to be careful. And, there was I was, and I really was just making the pun for myself. I didn't right. um, expect it to. Actually... I thought you said ostensibly. You did. And that was I a did say different word than ostensively. Right, it is no, a different I word. I was just saying, like, we're all going to get confused. <laughs> Let's look at an example like Andy Kaufman and his humor. 
Andy Kaufman would go to a club and he'd put a plant in there and he would engage in a comedy routine that then would involve a member of the audience who he knew, but then ended up being a kind of joke on the other audience. So he would play this kind of, it doesn't rise quite to the level of a, a genuinely private language because it involves himself and some other people, but it involves more than a ruse or a deception, like in a con, because it involves a manipulation. So he is self-consciously using a language game that he expects a reaction from his general audience in such a way. And it's sort of even playing with what their reaction is going to be without them understanding the game he's playing. So that's fine. What he's doing is he is manipulating the rules that they're playing by, but he needs to know what he needs to understand those rules in order to fuck with them. And it's not yeah. private because you can describe what he's doing. Yeah. I'm not making a strong argument for private right. language right here, but I guess what I would say is that the part that makes me think that there's a flavor or a, a rings of relative intimacy of language, maybe not genuinely private, has to do with both that example that I gave with Kaufman, but also the whole notion that we can figure something out so that we can figure out a language game that we have never played before by either example or watching it, as long as it's close enough, as long as it has some fingers or some resonances yeah. with it, but we can figure it out. And so that tells us something about the way we process language games or the way language works for us and gets to the root of sort of why this would be true, Wittgenstein's claims would be true, is that the example that we can just figure them out, that we can figure anything out at the end of the day. Right. If Wittgenstein were wrong about private language or personal rules, you would have to say something about Andy Kaufman, like, right, so Andy Kaufman, he's fucking with the audience, and he gets this internal feeling that he calls Bralia, and no one really knew what Bralia was. It was an emotion that only he could have. No one can refer to it. In fact, the only reason I know that he felt that is he said once, I feel the feeling Bralia. But no one has any idea what Bralia is. If that doesn't make sense, what he was really feeling is like amusement and maybe smug self-satisfaction is Bralia. And he doesn't really have that private feeling because we can talk about what he was doing. Even an individual who takes himself to be doing language in a new way or a different way has to be doing it in a way that it can be figured out. And I think that's right. Yeah, if the private language is the meanings can't possibly be known by anyone but the speaker, right? So it's not just that it happens to be private. It's right. if you created a private language for your diary and you were speaking about everyday sorts of things, in principle, we can translate that. So it's not really a private language in the strong sense that Wittgenstein means. He means that it's untranslatable. And the reason why Wittgenstein even brings that up is that he seems to be arguing against a Cartesian notion of mental states that are completely inaccessible to others. So Mark has pains and these specific states, I can't possibly know them. Not just that I don't happen to know them, but I, in principle, I can't possibly know those mental states. So should we read some text of the private language argument since we're talking about it? 199 is the first place I have a, a note that is something like where he starts to build towards the private language argument, though this is probably before we explicitly mentions it. Sure. It is relevant here because it's about obeying yeah. a rule. Right. And maybe I should read a connecting thing that's actually in the section that we are reading to see how tightly this whole thing fits together. I was looking at 31, mm -hmm. and he's talking about chess. And this is the third paragraph of 31. I'm explaining chess to someone, and I begin by pointing to a chessman and saying, this is the king. It can move like this, and so on. In this case, we shall say the words, this is the king, or this is called the king, are a definition only if the learner already knows what a piece in a game is. That is, if he has already played other games or has watched other people playing and understood and similar things. Further, only under these conditions will he be able to ask relevantly in the course of learning the game, what do you call this? That is, this piece in a game. We may say, only someone who already knows how to do something with it can significantly ask for a name. So that sort of starts off, and then a whole lot of what comes after that is, well, what is this rule following? I mean, he's already said it's not a matter of explicitly having a formula in your head that you consult, because just in our talking about how we figure out a new language game based on knowing other language games, it can't be something as instructive as that. And one of the things we were saying last time is that if you think that this rule following is a matter of sort of having an explicit rule in your head that you look at, well, then you would need instructions on how to interpret that rule, which would lead to an infinite regress, right? You can't have a rule about how to use a rule, about how to use a rule, etc. So then looking at ahead to uh, 
what did you say? One uh, ninety nine. One ninety nine. Yeah. yeah, is what we call obeying a rule something that it would be possible for only one man to do and to do only once in his life. This is, of course, a note on the grammar of the expression to obey a rule. And he says, so it's not. <laughs> it's not possible that there should have been only one occasion in which someone obeyed a rule. It is not possible there should have been only one occasion on which a report was made or an order given or understood, etc. To obey a rule, to make a report, to give an order, to play a game of chess are customs. That's sort of a preliminary to the body of the argument, right? Right. But you can see how it flows very naturally from what was going on earlier. Yeah. 204. As things are, I can, for example, invent a game that is never played by anyone. But would the following be possible too? Mankind has never played any games. Once, however, someone invented a game which no one ever played. He's still on about the rules. Yeah. I mean, it's all related, of course. That was 204. He gives a response to that. But that's just the queer thing about intention. This is in quotes, so it's his opponent. It is just the queer thing about intention, about the mental process, that the existence of a custom, of a technique, is not necessary to it. That, for example, it is imaginable that two people should play chess in a world in which otherwise no games existed, and that even that they should begin a game of chess and then be interrupted. And he answers, but isn't chess defined by its rules, and how are these rules present in the mind of the person who's intending to play chess? And then he goes more and more on, mm -hmm. this is related to that, the comments about meaning. Like, well, if you think meaning is something in the head... That's not going to capture it, just like obeying a rule is not something in the head because it's just not an explicit thing you could express in one sentence that you're reading off of some inner space in yourself. It is a complex and kind of flexible thing that enables you to act in a human way. I have this great image of someone like who's never, ever played games or, or known they exist. And you sit down with a chessboard and you're like, so here are the pieces. And they're like, the what? And you're like, the things that we move. And then I'm going to move one and then you move one. They're like, so in what order do you move them? Oh, I don't know. However, it's going to get to take my king. But why? Why would you want to think what he's getting at is you would have to explain before you could invent a game where there were no games before. You'd have to invent like playing and then playing a game. And then you'd have to suddenly build this entire notion just to give chess any sense whatsoever. 243. Uh, that's exactly what I was where looking. He, yeah. yeah. Go ahead and read it. A human being can encourage himself, give himself orders, obey, blame, and punish himself. He can ask himself a question and answer it. We could even imagine human beings who spoke only in monologue, who accompanied their activities by talking to themselves. An explorer who watched them and listened to their talk might succeed in translating their language into ours. This would enable him to predict the people's actions correctly, for he also hears them making resolutions and decisions. But could we also imagine a language in which a person could write down or give vocal expressions to his inner experiences, his feelings, moods, and the rest for his private use? Well, can't we do so in our ordinary language? But that is not what I mean. The individual words of this language are to refer to what can only be known to the person speaking, to his immediate private sensations, so another person cannot understand the language. And then he goes on with the private language right. argument. Well, yeah. I, yeah, we might as well read the next one. 244. How do words refer to sensations? There doesn't seem to be any problem here. Don't we talk about sensations every day and give them names? But how is the connection between name and a thing named set up? This question is the same as how does a human being learn the meaning of the names of sensations, of the word pain, for example? Here's one possibility. Words are connected with the primitive, the natural expressions of the sensation and used in their place. A child has hurt himself and he cries. Then adults talk to him and teach him exclamations and later sentences. They teach the child new pain behavior. Mm. All right. So he's already giving his what sounds very behaviorist yeah. alternative to the idea that, again, language based on ostension. So then language about inner states would have to be based on ostension is that I examine pain in myself and I say, oh, there's pain. Then there's a problem there. How do I know that what I mean by pain when I refer to myself is the same as what you mean by pain when you refer to yourself? And don't we all have unique psyches? And couldn't we come up with these words that refer to these strange feelings that only we have or we just can't know whether anyone has them? Uh, it doesn't that make sense? And he just thinks that that's just based on, again, a whole ridiculous conception of what linguistic meaning amounts to. Linguistic meaning is not a matter of having an image in your head when you say a word. Yeah. So 246, just two later, says, in what sense are my sensations private? Well, only I can know whether I am really in pain. Another person can only surmise it. In one way, this is wrong and in another nonsense. 
if we are using the word to know as it is normally used, and how else are we to use it? Then other people very often know when I am in pain. Yes, but all the same not with the certainty with which I know it myself. It can't be said of me at all, except perhaps as a joke, that I know I am in pain. What is it supposed to mean, except perhaps that I am in pain? Other people cannot be said to learn of my sensations only from my behavior, for I cannot be said to learn of them. I have them. The truth is, it makes sense to say about other people that they doubt whether I am in pain, but not to say it about myself. I think that's really hard for people to understand because he was sort of going back and forth between interlocutor and response. Well, okay, so maybe they need to have the text in front of them. <laughs> but the basic idea is that he doesn't think it makes sense to say we know our own private sensations. We have them. And it's a result of a misunderstanding of what it means to know something that we would ascribe a claim like having a private language because we never own yeah. our sensations in a way of knowing them. This one, I think, doesn't work very well because I think he's ascribing to the concept of knowing something which really belongs to the concept of assertion in general of the kind of the reason why we don't say I know I'm in pain to someone and generally in language is not because it doesn't make sense from the standpoint of the concept. No, it's just because we don't make that kind of assertion to people unless they have reason to doubt it. So the reason to doubt thing comes up with respect to the concept of assertion, not with respect to the concept of no. I think jumping on its weakness right there, because I think it's part of the private language argument, but it's not all of it. That's one of the sort of threads he's using to argue against private language, but I don't think it's the, the strongest one. What are the other prongs of the private language argument besides uh, a kind of epistemological claim? In order for a word to have meaning, it must be able to be right or wrong. There must be some correct description of meaning or incorrect description of meaning according to the language game. But that language game always occurs at the level of community. So you can't get meaning at the individual private level. So even if you're making these individual descriptions, later on he's going to talk about naming a sensation as S or something like that. That activity isn't doing what on first blush it looks to us like it's doing because we're already presupposing the language game, but a truly private language couldn't rest on that community language game in general. And so you couldn't really get meaning at that level. I don't think I've done a very good job of describing that, but I think that's the other major prong of the argument. Formally, the uh, private language argument is thought to start at 256. This is on the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. So some of the things we read are sort of the precursors to it, which actually I want to read 255 because it's one of his pithy things. It's just uh, the philosopher's treatment of a question is like the treatment of an illness. <laughs> what does that mean? I wrote a question mark by that. It means that questions only arise because, and he has other earlier pithy sayings in the work to support this, because we've taken some word out of its customary context and we don't know what to do with it. So in this case, what we understand in situations where we call something knowledge is I'm looking for my shoe and, oh, there is my shoe. Now I know where my shoe is. But looking at our own inner states is not, we might want to attach the word knowledge to that, but it's really not appropriate. So the philosophical problems arise from misuse of language, right? Yep. The true approach here is to relieve ourselves of those problems, not by developing the right theory, but by therapeutically getting rid of our misuse of language. Right. One really, I think, good way to say this, and this was a comment that someone made on Reddit in response to something I said once that just kind of blew me away. Someone said that what we normally think of as philosophy is an emergent property of discussion, not a thing to do separately as its own thing. And in these discussions, problems arise. Philosophy allows us to like figure out what the answer to that problem is therapeutically is a good word, right? So we treat a question by, we examine it, we lay it out, but it's not something that we have to make. I guess the important thing there is philosophy is an emergent property of discussions. So on Wittgenstein's view of what philosophy should be doing, we can never really get rid of philosophy in the sense of answer all the philosophical questions that there are. We can only treat the questions that arise, that will arise emerging from discussions. And the reason why questions arise is 
It's just a characteristic of language or a characteristic of us or... Yeah, it's just a characteristic of discussions. I think it's a clash between different language games. Taking something out of one context and putting it into another. Like I was just thinking about sarcasm in this context, that sarcasm sort of relies on everybody normally telling the truth. Sarcasm is a parasitic phenomena. So sort of imagine a society of, you know, a junior high with no teachers where everyone is sarcastic. Then like, well, what does that even mean? How would you understand anyone? Or does every, is it just opposite day? Or is there, there's something that would be taking the concept of sarcasm out of its usual environment, which is a rebellion against the straight laced or something like that. And so you could then, it could become like a Zen koan, the one hand clapping, or does the tree fall in a forest? The, uh, what is a sarcastic person in a, in a room of all sarcastic people or something? And he would want to say, no, that's obviously a bullshit philosophical question. That's just understand what sarcasm is and it'll go away. So that's an easy one. Right. <laughs> but virtue or something. You know, so questions about like, what really is a sentient being? Can artificial intelligence ever become sentient? That's a philosophical question that emerges out of discussions about what art sentience is and what artificial intelligence, what direction it's going in. And we can treat that question by, oh, so what do we normally mean by sentience? This is really important. It will never be the case that like, oh, good, science has answered all the questions. There's nothing for philosophy to do. Science has told us that AI is sentient. How did it do that? It's parasitic on a particular use of sentient. But we can't ever, like, get rid of philosophical questions. We can only treat them as they arise, lay them out. But the reason, like, for that particular case, this seems to me the reason why that question arises is because you would make a claim that there's a similarity between a computer or uh, some kind of program that you see a likeness with a human being or even before you have computers, just a mechanical system that operates without you touching it, mm -hmm. that seems to have its own activity. And then you make the leap, well, it seems to be alive because it has its own activity. And the root of all that is making the leap that one thing is like another. And this goes to what Mark was saying, that you are applying one language game to another language game. So there's this kind of likeness, this pattern matching or whatever you want to call it that we have, that we do, that tries to overlap one thing into another. And maybe in sort of the frisian of that, you get both something like philosophy or that activity in trying to sort that out. But it's born out of this activity of finding things to be like one another and trying to see if they really are or not. And part of that ends in trying to become atomistic about it. And part of it comes in giving up the notion of being atomistic about it because you can't reduce it. Right. So one way to clarify that sort of confusion of possible likeness, I think probably the right way to Wittgenstein here is to examine what do we mean when we say this thing? Let's try and make that clearer so that we understand how this word is typically being used. The wrong way to go about it and what earlier Wittgenstein tried to do is by stipulation. The wrong way to go about figuring out if robots are humans, if they're sentient, is to stipulate robots are not sentient. Boom. That's not what philosophy should do. And when it does that, that's when problems arise. And here's another criticism of this sort, just to give another example. From our Philosophy of Mind episode, we read some Gilbert Ryle, and he talked of the Cartesian dualism as a category mistake, where basically Descartes' theory that there's a substance, soul, is a product of thinking of reifying something that's really an abstract term that doesn't have a fixed object that it's referring to. So other terms of the sort, like university, university as more of an abstraction. And it's, you know, you're not going to say, okay, here's this ball of substance in my hand. University must stand for something like this. Same thing for soul. And the idea is that that kind of mistake is a product of the way language works of grammar. We expect any noun to sort of have this nice, solid, tangible referent to it. And so we slip up on that. And so that's where some philosophical problems come from. Ultimately, I don't find that very convincing. I argued in that episode that, in fact, 
it's not a category mistake and that even if you reject Cartesian dualism, it's actually a legitimate attempt to come up with a theory to solve a legitimate problem. But that's another matter. And I, and I think here, this idea that philosophical problems arise out of problems of misuse of language, let's say, or bad habits instilled in us by language or, or trying to take it out of context, I don't find that convincing. I think philosophical problems are have their own legitimacy even after you've done all this language stuff. I generally think of Wittgenstein as providing the groundwork for folks like Ryle, like you were just discussing, but it sounded like, bro, you were just saying that the upshot of Wittgenstein here is that we need... Were you contradicting that or were you just saying, oh, there is a role for philosophy, but the role of philosophy is dissolving these problems. But it sounded like you were saying by philosophy should not stipulate you were saying something different than that, that you were saying something more like what Wes is arguing for, which is that these perennial philosophical problems will stay alive regardless of the outcome of science. I was also saying that philosophical problems will exist regardless of the progress of science. I do also agree that the role of philosophy is to dissolve these problems. Some people have taken a really hardline stance out of Wittgenstein that, like, philosophy is bullshit. I'm not saying there's not a lot of bullshit done in philosophy, but I'm not saying something like, there is no role for philosophy. What I mean by philosophy shouldn't stipulate is Wittgenstein seems to be saying the wrong way to go about dissolving these problems is to just declare an answer. So let's say something like, you declare sentience is anything that is like humans but isn't a robot. Well, then someone might say, well, what if a virus got out, like a nanoparticle virus got out, and that eventually evolved techno-organically into a robot, but it's made of the things that this robot we built is made of. So then you have to go back and stipulate something like, okay, nothing built is sentient, but evolution, that's fine. And so you have to make these stipulations when you freeze one variable, all of a sudden everything else goes haywire. So you have to start freezing new things, and that's how you get philosophical problems of the sort that Wittgenstein is dismissing. So the idea is that you look at use in order to figure these things out and not simply right. stipulate. How are these words right. actually used? And so right. for some background, Gilbert Ryle was a, considered one of these ordinary language philosophers who variously were thought to sort of be working in the tradition of later Wittgenstein, but then they denied that they were doing exactly the same thing or they denied his influence. And I think Wittgenstein didn't want to be associated with him either. Uh, I think he is still living when some of that stuff was going on. But the ordinary language philosophers as well, like Ryle, were focused on looking at how words were being used. G. Moore was, you know, another notorious, notorious one for that, right? I hear two things going on in this discussion about whether you can be doing philosophy. One would be that, well, at the end, all philosophy is a kind of therapy. It's therapeutic. What do we mean when we say that term? That is therapeutic. We had this in, in the Buddhism episode as well. Yes. The, the idea there oh, okay. was that Buddhist ethics was more therapeutic than Aristotelian ethics. And the idea was that, so for instance, in Aristotelian ethics, you had to have the right sort of upbringing and then developing these virtues was a matter of, I think to some extent, habituation and learning, let's say. And the therapeutic idea is that you actually have to get rid of certain bad proclivities. So in Buddhist ethics, you have lust and these other poisons in your desire that you have to work to get rid of. And they're universal to all human beings. And no matter how good your upbringing is, you have these things that need to be therapeutically gotten rid of. And I think that's the idea here with Wittgenstein, that once we start reflecting on things, once we start using language to talk about language, let's say, which is inevitably what we're doing when we're reflecting we naturally develop these sorts of confusions that can therapeutically be removed when we learn not to play the wrong sort of game, when we learn not to involve ourselves in these confusions. And I think, again, looking at the way language is used is one way to get out of that. So one of the confusions, for instance, is the way he starts the whole work, which is the idea that ostension is a model for language in general, or the idea that these descriptive atomic sentences are a model for the way language works in general. That sort of approach, instead of looking at the way language is actually used, it's motivated by the attempt to theorize, right? By the attempt to create a model where we can make these very firm links between, let's say, atomic sentences and facts in the world and then build up the rest of the world out of that. That attempt to theorize and build a nice model to explain everything, I think, goes out the window here. Those theories are become misguided and our propensity even to engage in that theorizing, that kind of theorizing behavior, I think he seems to think needs to be therapeutically 
removed. But this goes exactly to the other prong, which seems to me that you were speaking of, which was criticizing Ryle for dismissing the Cartesian argument, saying that even if there are problems with the Cartesian argument, things like that are still philosophically live and breathing. They're not laid to rest because they are useful. No, actually, what I was saying was, so Ryle was arguing that, so I think most of us agree that Cartesian substance dualism doesn't work as a theory. But Raoul was saying, well, it's not just that it's a bad theory, it's not meaningful. It's not even a meaningful theory. It's a category mistake. And so I'm arguing that no, it's actually, it's a meaningful theory that meaningfully attempts to solve a problem. It happens to be a bad theory. But Raoul is saying something much stronger, and that's what I reject, the idea that it's simply meaningless. I still think you could be, without taking the hard line of Ryle, his conclusion, taking Wittgenstein's approach here is useful for that problem. So you say, why do we think we have minds? Well, because we talk to each other and we use these terms like belief or desire, and we can sort of think about in what context we actually use them. But it would be... But that's just a post... You already have to believe that the theory is wrong. That's just a post hoc rationalization of why it's wrong. You're giving a genetic account of how did we come into this confusion? You, you're not really giving an argument of... No, I'm not. I'm not saying in advance that it is a confusion. I'm saying if you're going to make a claim that the soul is not a substance, the soul is not an object, then you have to come up with some... All right. Well, maybe I am... Yeah, because it could be the case that we have all kinds of motivations and even illegitimate motivations pushing us in the direction of saying the soul is an object. But that doesn't say anything about whether the soul is actually an object. That's just... So that's the genetic fallacy, right? So whatever our motivations are, that's fine. It's great to give an, an account of human motivations. Once you believe it's false, once you believe we've made this mistake, then yeah, we need to figure out, well, what motivated us? How did we fall into that trap? But in, unless we know that already that it's a mistake, simply describing those motivations won't tell us that it's a mistake. Well, I think that your point about the genetic fallacy gets exactly to the point of your problems with pragmatism before and the problems you're expressing with Wittgenstein here. That All these folks say, for instance, going back to the thing we hashed to death in the pragmatism episodes about truth, and you said folks like Russell and even later pragmatists like Rorty want to distinguish between what truth actually is and how we figure out that something is true. Mm -hmm. which is exactly what a pragmatist like William James is going to deny. And I think Wittgenstein would also be denying that, that I thought in my Tractatus days, the truth, following Russell, following Frege, the truth was this primary indefinable thing that it's like a binary, every atomic sentence either is true or is not true. But if you're going to take Wittgenstein's approach in this book, then you would have to say, in what context do we use the word truth? How do we learn about to act appropriately in these contexts. And it might just be the case that there are plenty of things that just aren't true or aren't false. Like it's just, it's an inappropriate concept to apply. And I, I think maybe some of these, is the mind the same as the body or something? Wittgenstein is going to say, those two concepts come from different language games. And so there really isn't a yes or no answer. Just the concept of truth does not apply to that at all. Is that just nonsense? The concept of truth doesn't apply to what? To the claim, the mind is the body, or the mind is a separate substance from the body. Both of these involve some sort of grammatical mistake. Those are meaningless for Wittgenstein, so yeah, you can't yes. ascribe early a... Wittgenstein, those are meaningless. Well, I think for both. Isn't, am I wrong about that? Yeah. I don't think he wants to say that it's meaningless to say that the thing we are referring to with the mind... I don't know if he wants to You're say right. those are meaningless. He probably Not wants to say something like, that philosophical problem isn't interesting or productive trying to decide is the mind the same as the body what are you going to do about that well it involves a mistake of language games right. it involves a confusion of language games and when you try to describe what the two language games are you're doing exactly what i was trying to do that wes was objecting to you're giving a genetic account of how we find out about you know what is our interaction with body well a body gets sick if i punch you in the body then you know there's all these things that we can say about how we know about bodies. And there are different things that we would say about how we know about minds or pains or something. And so you could say that whatever the relationship is between these, at least this distinction of language is informative, that we don't have to be forced into this, what, fallacy of misplaced concreteness of putting them all in the same ontological category. It doesn't mean you have to take Ryle's hard line and say, 
it's actually meaningless to even ask the question, but there's something a little screwed up in asking the question because these concepts don't come from quite the same place. So maybe the solution then is to elaborate a very complex story, you know, about emergence or something like this, about how these things relate. Right. And by the way, we do need to return to private language after we're done with all this, right? Yes. (laughs) Okay. But this is interesting. This is very on point. Part of this is that the claim about the relative truth value and that while we're doing lots of language games and stuff like that is in one way very second order because you still have to use those games, right? So on the one hand, you can be conscious of the fact that you are participating in these games. And in fact, I suspect what Wittgenstein would say that you are in fact conscious of this all the time because you apply different kinds of language games in different sorts of situations and ways of life all the time. But you still have to also participate in a game. No. No, Wittgenstein explicitly rejects second-order philosophy. Well, okay, so this is where I want to understand it a little bit better, because it seems to me that in the way that you can talk about how all your practices are therapeutic, yada, 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 the fact is you're going to have to have some practices, and you will have some practices, even if they are somehow de facto or unchosen, and they will involve following some rules in a game. And you can be then conscious of that fact and maybe refine your games and maybe self-consciously participate in a kind of therapy for them, but you're still going to be participating in a game. And so the discussion gets to be very second order about what you're doing rather than just doing something, right? While all the while recognizing that there might be limits to what you're doing, but not harping on the fact that there are always limits to what you're doing. So you're saying that what Wittgenstein is doing is second order in that he's talking about how language games work, and then he says, and we use language games this way, but he doesn't ever do that. right? So he's saying philosophy should be therapeutic, let's not get wrapped up in arbitrary metaphysical questions, but he never shows you what we should be doing instead. Is that what you're... Well, I'm not saying that he would even want to say what we're supposed to be doing instead, right? Recognizing that there are limits and that there's games involved and so forth would go a long way say, in a political realm, to subverting dogmatism and that sort of thing. It seems to me that there would be an activity of more productively than others engaging in thinking about something. And one of the reasons I was thinking about this had to do with what Wes was saying earlier about Descartes and the usefulness of Descartes' mind-body dualism and stuff like that. I was not focusing on what his criticism of Ryle was. And to me, it was interesting that it was worth understanding and thinking through Descartes' claims, and not because they were simply wrong, but because it is a structure, I don't know if it rises exactly to a language game, but a structured claim about the world. And that that is a different kind of thing than what Wittgenstein is doing. Wittgenstein is saying something about the way we make claims about the world. That's what I mean by being second order. He's making claims about the way we make claims about the world. Right. But I could see where you're, you could be critical of how he's not being positive enough because, for instance, that exchange that I just had with Wes about Ryle, I don't think Wittgenstein gives very good guidance on how do you tell a good account of what language games are going on from a bad one. Wes was saying that if I'm trying to give this genetic account of, well, we come up with mind from certain interactions with each other, and we come up with body from different interactions with each other. And Wes was saying, no, that's just all because you've already decided the issue in your head and you're making up these accounts after the fact. And I don't think Wittgenstein has a good way of telling us when we're just bullshitting about what is a language game and what is not in situations like that. It seems to me that that's the kind of thing that Wittgenstein is going to fail to do. And in some ways, this is the kind of problem that you have in pragmatism, which I'm also very sympathetic with, which is that you talk about the activity itself as activities without giving necessarily a lot of guidance about how you judge between individual activities, because you're going to maintain along the way that certain ways of doing things are better than others. You don't want to be fundamentally relativist in this respect. Maybe Wittgenstein will end up being extraordinarily relativist. I guess it doesn't seem to me that he is. That He seems to me to be pointing out a multiplicity and aspectualness to language that is intrinsic and fundamental, 
but trying to sidestep at least, if not deny, utter relativity, which would sort of lead to a kind of meaninglessness. It seems like he would just say that the best language games or the best way to play language games are just the ways that are most successful. So in that sense, I don't know if it's relative so much as relativized, right? Like whichever language game is best going to accomplish conveying your meaning or conveying meaning. I don't want to privilege your meaning there. Well, the problem of... Which sounds circular the way you just right, put right. it. I don't because... want to... Yeah. <laughs> the problem of relativism arises because the criterion of correctness is community use. And we can't really ask whether the whole community could be wrong about anything. Right. Right and wrong doesn't make sense at that level. Right and wrong only makes sense in comparing the individual to community use. So that's another long argument. What immediately comes to mind there is ethics. And a couple episodes from now, we will have an episode specifically on Alistair McIntyre on virtue ethics, who is following up on Wittgenstein in this way. We can save the particular analysis of that very obvious but huge topic for then. So it's relative, but in this really, really super loose way that, like, it doesn't matter what words you pick to refer to things as long as everyone agrees to that word, right? So the color that we know is red, it's relative in that other languages' words for red are perfectly good words. But it's not relative in the sense that, like, is red closer to orange than it is to blue and corresponding words our semantic theory though right has to give us grounds for true and false and so if it meaning is use right then we're not going to get a true and false we're not going to get a correspondence theory any any kind of theory that is grounded in say comparison of language to the world and so naturally those relativistic problems arise yep which is not to say you know it's necessarily relativist but there's an argument to be had there i see what you're saying I don't know how far I want to pursue this just offhand. Yeah, let's punt that to a Rorty episode. Or yeah, something. no, that's, yeah, in the and, future. Then to, and it gets boring very quickly. <laughs> Boy, does it. One of the really positive things that I get out of this around uh, 65 to 67 here is this notion of family resemblances, which we haven't brought up explicitly, but it, that's super important. It's exactly where we've been going with a lot of this. He uses the idea of a game partly to say, he says in 66, you know, consider all the things that we call games, board games, card games, ball games, Olympic games, and so on. What is common to them all? Don't say there must be something common or they would not be called games, but look and see whether there's anything common to them all. Or if you look at them, you will not see something that is common to all, but similarities, relationships, and a whole series of them at that. And then by 67, he says, I can think of no better expression to characterize these similarities than family resemblances. For the various resemblances between members of a family, build, features, color, of eye, gait, temperament, etc. And I shall say, games form a family. And so this is actually going to be his overall toppling of what a definition is going back to Aristotle, where... And going back to Plato, where Plato says, you haven't said what justice is. You've just given me some examples of justice. And you should be able to look at what all those have in common. And that's what justice is. And Wittgenstein is just flatly denying that that's just not how language works. There might be a lot of things we call games or justice or virtue or truth. And they're just not going to be comparable. You can't just find something that's common among them or pick, you know, this is the right one or something. It's more a case. Normally when I would introduce this in a class or something, talk about uh, you've got a paradigm case and then you have borderline cases. So if you ask, what is a bird in essence, there really is no answer to that, but there is psychologically things that we typically think of when we call birds and then things that are like penguins or emus. There are you know, things that we might not be sure whether it's a bird or not that are the borderline cases. Reading this this time, I discovered actually he wouldn't use that term borderline because he has a quote in here somewhere that says, uh, what is a fuzzy border? Like there's nothing that is a fuzzy border. Either there's a border there or there's not a border. So if really concepts kind of melt into each other because we're getting out of the normal uses of the words, then you can't say there are borderline cases. You just say there are cases that are part of a different language game or are not specified in the standard language game. Yeah, but it seems to me that he's wrong about that, right? There are all kinds of fuzzy borders. I don't really get that. Why would he deny that there are fuzzy borders? It seems like what he's saying is that... There's ultra-fuzzy borders. <laughs> right. You can't say like, oh, there's a border there, but it's kind of fuzzy. Let's clarify. The borders are so fuzzy, they break down altogether. Right. So the thing about borderline cases isn't that they fall one way or the other on the border, and we just can't decide where. The thing about borderline cases is, who the fuck knows? That's what makes a, like, I don't know, good question is the right answer to a borderline case. But what's interesting about that is let's say I have a border stripe, 
So what you're saying is, is that there are cases that are clearly away from the border on either side. Right. Rather than being a line, there's a sort of no man's land. Yeah. And that, in fact, there is a kind of gradation along that no man's land from one side to the other. And in this in-between time, it's who the fuck knows. Right. But in addition, there are cases where it's utterly clear one side or the other. Yeah. It's not clear that he's saying that all concepts work this way in the same way that the concept of game does, right? Not all concepts work by the overlapping family resemblances principle, or am I wrong about that? Would it be... Maybe the natural concepts that sort of arise organically, yeah, that those maybe that's are all good... fuzzy. Whereas, yeah, yeah, you could invent a game where we just define something very specifically. And then if that catches on. But also like mathematical concepts or yeah. there are lots of examples that are, you get nice, strict delimitations of your concepts, right? So here's a really good example of what he's talking about. I think you're right that like the natural concepts is a good sort of way to gesture at the concepts that have this property, but any attempt to figure out, okay, so find which words work this way and which ones don't, you're going to end up not being able to draw a line between the kind of concepts that are fuzzy and the kind that are clear except there. I think that one really helpful way to think about what Wittgenstein is saying is anywhere he makes an assertion, it's implicitly followed by except when it's not. Which concepts are like this? The natural ones. Oh, except when it's not a natural one. Dylan, I think you're right that there are always, not always, there are often clear cases and not clear cases, and then the border, no man's land, is a good way to think about it. Here's an example that I never get tired of because I spent some time in the South. Baseball, clearly a sport. Bananas, clearly not a sport. NASCAR, how do we feel about NASCAR? Sport, not a sport? Who knows? In the South, they're going to insist, absolutely, it's a sport. Anywhere else, they're going to say they're just kind of driving cars real fast. Like, that's not a sport any more than chess is a sport. And some people are going to say no, but according to this criterion, chess is a sport. And that's just not how we use those words. There's not a right or wrong answer as to whether NASCAR is a sport. Yeah, spoiler alert, there is. It's not a sport. That's the right answer. But that's just me and the way that I typically tend to play the language game. But there's not like an absolute right or wrong way to answer that. Some people use that word in a very slightly different way than I do. And that's just all there is to it. But going to the community use case, if I then say, as long as I agree on my language game, I'm going to constrain the cases that are fuzzy to be many fewer. So in the case with your example with NASCAR, it seems pretty much that it comes down to an argument about what you mean by sport and what language game you're engaging in when you use that word and speak of that universe of things and what the criteria are for calling something a sport. And then it becomes a discussion about that because it's a kind of semantic argument. It's the same thing with marriage, right? The whole marriage argument going on has to do with what you want to have that word mean. But you can also agree on the rules for what you mean by that word. And then it becomes much easier to speak about whether it falls in this category or that category because you've established the rules for it. Well, you've established rules for it in a particular language game, say the legal language game. Yeah. Right. So one really weird thing that Rick Santorum does is he gives this stupid fucking speech where he says that um, gay marriage can't be a thing. Because marriage just is, by definition, between a man and a woman. There's no such thing as gay marriage. And we would say, like, really? Because there's a law that says gay people can get married, and that's how that law uses that word. So the problem there is that Rick Santorum is trying to take a word out of context and freeze it when we can just agree to use it in this particular way. But that doesn't become the meaning of marriage, is this legal contract. That just means in this particular language game, the legal language game, that word takes on this meaning. But that doesn't define once and for all, like, all the ways people in America can use the word marriage. So he might say something like, well, but marriage in God's eyes exists between a man and a woman. And your response there wouldn't be, yes, it does. The law defines it that way. Your response would be, that's not the language game we're playing, asshole. We're talking about legally. And those are different things. Besides which, God's eye is infinitely large, so a, a gay couple could fit in there, no problem. Yeah, right. By the way, looking at 66, where he tries to debunk the notion that there's any common property to games, I'm still sympathetic to the, the idea that games all have rules. <laughs> what about Calvin Ball? <laughs> Say it again. Calvin Ball? 
Calvin Ball and Calvin and Hobbes. I think go that's ahead and a, describe it. Calvin Ball is a game where you just make up the rules as you go. Someone can just declare a rule. There's still rules. You're just making them up as you go. But you can undo those rules whenever you want. But then that's just another meta rule. Well, but I, I think this is a good example because it illustrates what happens when you end up making up the rules literally as you go along. Because what happens is that it always ends, in this case, it ends in violence. <laughs> <laughs> or in an utter end of the game because no one knows what to do. When I would go to the bus stop where I used to live and wait with the kids till the bus came, they're all like eight years old, and they would be throwing the football around or playing a game 500 or something. And the way these kids would work is that the ones who were had you know essentially bullying kind of tendencies, they would all change the rules as they went along to their own advantage all the time. Yep. And the frustration was palpable because they were not playing by the rules. And then after a while, they would assert a certain set of rules, and then they would tweak them again to their own advantage, literally playing Calvin Ball, changing the rules all the time as you go along. And what ends up happening is that it becomes about a unspoken set of rules, which has to do with a kind of, you know, the rules of the bully and the rules of power and stuff like that. Yeah, that's no longer Calvin Ball, at least as, as I'm interpreting Calvin Ball, because I'm getting the sense of Calvin Ball, you're making up the rules as you go along, but it's a form of play, right? The agreement is that you're making up the rules as you go along, and there's still this meta rule about what you're doing and how that constitutes play. Or take a simpler case with, say, something that doesn't look like we would call it a game, like two kittens playing, for instance, because we know animals play, and we know that's very important to development. What are the rules there? Well, the idea is that, for instance, one kitten is biting another, but they're not biting to do harm. There's a certain amount of restraint involved. There's a certain amount of aggression, but there's a certain amount of restraint. And so there are these implicit circumscribing boundaries to what goes on, even to something that looks fairly amorphous. Like